All right, guys, back here on Southeastern 14 with Max Barr as we are uh, recapping the Wednesday night action in SEC basketball. It was um, not the best night. We, you know, Max pumping up the SEC going undefeated on Tuesday, did not go undefeated on Wednesday. A couple losses for the conference, uh, but also had an emphatic win for one of the best teams in the conference. But we'll get to that here in a second. Before we do, let's tell you once again about our friends at Bet Online. Holiday season, as you guys know, off and rolling. NFL in full stride, NBA and NHL, also in midseason form at this point. Uh, so head over to Bet Online, your number one destination for all your sports wagering info. Up to the minute sports wagering news, odds, trends, predictions. Bet Online, the top spot for pro and amateur sports. Remember, not just the big four. Um, you have all this info available at your fingertips, desktop, and mobile access anytime for almost any sport that is played. MMA to international soccer, it's all there. So if you want to bet on these games, which, by the way, we are doing our prediction videos for the upcoming weekend's games, if you want to bet on those, you can do it by heading to betonline.ag today. Use that promo code BELIEVE, B-L-E-A-V, 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Remember, 50%, folks. Use that promo code B-L-E-A-V, BetOnline, where the game starts. All right, Max, let's get into quickly recapping these games from Wednesday night. San Francisco, 73, Vanderbilt, 60. We said this was going to be a challenge for the Commodores. It was, and, well, uh, they fall to 4-5 and five now after the loss here. Um, big takeaways from this game, I guess. I don't have a ton. It's just, I mean, look, Vanderbilt's going to struggle to, I think, beat anybody when it comes to um, if they don't get the most out of Ezra Mignon and Tyron Lawrence night in and night out, they're just going to have a hard time winning these kind of games. And we saw it here in a 13 point loss. Yeah. All off season, we were saying, you know, when a team has these two guys in the backcourt referring to Mignon and Lawrence, they're like, they can beat anyone with those two. They have what they need. Well, when one of those two doesn't show up, you need someone else to, and no one really did. Um, and Stackhouse, man, I've never really, he was very vocal in the press conference um, about Tyron Lawrence. Uh, he was asked, you know, why didn't he play Tyron Lawrence that much? Uh, Stackhouse goes, he wasn't doing nothing. Now, whoa, whoa. Um, Stackhouse said that just to start the game, uh, Lawrence gave about eight to 10 points worth for San Fran. Said he wouldn't back box out, gave up a backdoor cut, took some bad shots, didn't get back on defense. So he took him out, said, I'll, I'll let someone else try to, try to play tonight. Um, so he was not happy with Lawrence's performance. Uh, Stack said that they kicked their ass on the rebounds. He said that. Um, Lubin only had two rebounds. Only had one defensive rebound the entire game to Lubin. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, just that was a poor effort game from Bandy, I think. And Stackhouse was upset with it after. Just did not get what you needed out of Lawrence. No energy on the glass. Uh, no real – Effort, really? I mean, San, San Francisco just bullied them. So, I mean, tough result. And I don't really know if these things are fixable. You know, are they ever going to crush the boards against any team? I mean, this was just disappointing. What do you think, Blake? I mean, I'm just dis disappointed. Yeah, I mean, what? They, they played 12 guys, Vanderbilt did. So, you know, they played 12 players in this game. And you still felt like you could never sort of push the right button and get the right combination. And that's, that's not ideal. Like we just said, I mean, can you fix that? I mean, you are going to find it. I mean, we've seen these kind of seasons for teams over the years where at some point, you know, you're just like, Hey, we're just going to go with the guys that are giving us the most they have. And you just hope that the chemistry comes together with whoever those guys are. But right now, I mean, it's clear they're trying to figure out exactly what that looks like. Um, and like we said, I mean, it's, it was rough out of the gate because you know, they didn't have their full team and they've been mixing and matching and all this other stuff. But now it's kind of a situation where, yeah, this was a big opportunity. We talked about like, this was an important game for them because yeah. now you look at it, Texas Tech, Western Carolina, Memphis, Dartmouth. You can probably win two of those games, but guess what? Right now they're only favored by a point over Western Carolina, according to Ken Palm. Um, you know, Texas Tech, they're going to be double digit underdog. Memphis, they're probably going to be a double digit. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's not a good spot to be in and like you said, they get dominated on the glass. I think it was 39-21 in the rebounding department. Uh, and that never led in the game at all. So, yeah, frustrating performance. And I know Vanderbilt fans are frustrated. Um, coaching staff probably frustrated. Everybody frustrated probably 
right now, uh, just based on how the season has started off after, again, they built so much momentum towards the end of last season uh, there with the Commodores. But, yep, uh, they will now, like I said, play Texas Tech on Saturday. Not an ideal matchup there either. All right, uh, let's get to what was the game of the night. Clemson gets the 72-67 win over South Carolina, so the Gamecocks unbeaten no more. But they may not, you know, they may have lost their first game, Max, but I still feel like I came out of this just as excited about South Carolina moving forward Um, because this was, like we said, this was an important game in terms of playing a really good Clemson team. Um, you know, said Clemson, if anyone doubts, they are the real deal now. Disappointed by for South Carolina because they did have, you know, they were leading by double digits in the second half. Um, but I still think this is one of those where, again, it's a loss, but they didn't shoot it well. I mean, you know, they struggled and still felt like they had a chance to win the game. Um, I know they made 10 threes, by the way. I'm just saying overall the, the shooting percentages were not great. I think they shot 38% from two or 39% from two, something like that. But, um, Again, give credit to Clemson on that uh, for, for making the plays. And this was a really good game. And like I said, I know South Carolina lost, but I'm not, my opinion hasn't changed. I still think the Gamecocks are trending upward. So if there's a way to win while losing, this was the way. This was, this was I tweeted it last night. I said, this is a win in my eyes. Uh, Clemson, been saying it, are legit. Got multiple different pieces that they can go to in different times when they go through droughts when people get in foul trouble this is a well-rounded team south carolina should have won this game had it yeah. they had it um and they had it while bj mack and studi only combined one of 11 from three one of 11 from studi and mack okay colin murray boils only his second game back from mono only his second game back if you have never had mono that thing floors you for like a good yeah. solid month or two it drains everything out of you. So he has his first double-digit minute performance, and he's playing big minutes down the stretch with five minutes left. He's in the game, Murray Boyles. six seven, a little bit more physical. Uh, Lamont Paris was asked about it after the game. He said, uh, you're searching in those moments for someone to play well, and some of our guys weren't playing well. Uh, Jacoby Wright, I think he's referring to, was 0, and, 0 for 5. Just wasn't shooting it. Just wasn't shooting it good that, uh, good that night, and – Murray Boyles has a little bit more size, a little bit more rebounding, and he gets the nod. That's one of the things that this South Carolina didn't have last year, is the ability to win multiple ways and bring in solid freshmen that will give you effort, something Lamont Paris could have used last year. So, yeah, I mean, I'm excited. I'm even more excited about this team. They just went into one of the best teams in the ACC and should have won. So you're looking at the rest of this schedule before conference play. They could be on a little bit of a roll here, Blake. I know it's it. This is the the pessimist in me is like they play at East Carolina on Saturday and it just feels like one of those games where it's just a trap. Like oh, no. you're coming off this big game against Clemson. I'm like, please don't do this South Carolina. That's all I ask. Like I am all in on the Gamecocks right now and I just don't do it. Don't give us one of those losses to talk about where we have to rethink things. Um, Getting flashbacks of Wilmington. I, I know it's like, don't do it. Um, I mean, like East Carolina six and three. They did. <laughs> you know who East Carolina's best win is? Who? UNC Wilmington. Oh no! You just you just jinxed it. You set this whole thing up. So you're getting flashbacks to Wilmington. East Carolina's best win at six and three is UNC Wilmington, who they beat at home on November the thirtieth. Um, they oh, were the Lord. game before Wilmington went and beat Kentucky. So. Oh my, this game, it's a huge game now. Circle it on your calendar. South Carolina, yeah. East Carolina. Dangerous game. So, oh man. I just, just shook my on. whole week up, Blake. Yeah, we uh, we might have to preview this one individually on Saturday. Um, I don't think we will, but South Carolina just, just win the game. That's all we ask. But yeah, the rest of the schedule does set up nicely leading into the start of SEC play. So, um, all right. <sighs> Missed opportunity for the Gamecocks, but I think they're going to be okay. Just got to beat East Carolina, though. So, all right. Speaking of teams that won games, um, Whew. Texas A&M did that against DePaul <laughs> in a in a way that you would have liked to, to see it happen. Uh, they just dominated this game. Uh, again, talk about teams that never led. Uh, DePaul never led in this game. A&M was up. My goodness. What are they up? 35, I think, at one point here. Um, 
34, 35. I don't remember what it was. Something in there. Um, you know, Radford still didn't play. We talked about that beforehand. Uh, that was not surprising. But you had, what was it, seven players score between nine and 14 points here. Uh, a lot of balance. And again, like you mentioned, DePaul is just not a, they're not a good team. And so you wanted to see A&M kind of come out here, put the foot on the gas. They did that, shot the ball really well, hit 14 threes. Uh, that was nice to see. Uh, Jace Carter, Wade Taylor doing the bulk of the work there. Each of them had four on that one. Um, yeah, so I thought, you know, this was only had four turnovers. Like this was the kind of game where we talk about A&M at their best. And remember, we're still talking about him without Tyrese Rafford. If he's back, you know, that adds another player because he's the second best player on the team. Um, but like at their best, A&M is a team that, you know, can can win the SEC because they just they can sort of dissect you, and especially if they're making shots, right? I mean, if they're hitting 14 threes, good luck. Nobody's beating them. Um, I don't think they're going to do that every game, but still, I mean, there's, there's a lot of upside with this team and a, a dominant win here over DePaul. Hello, Mr. Jace Carter. Thank you for joining us, finally. 11 three-point attempts. This is the volume I was looking for the wing. I've been saying all offseason, who's stepping in for Dexter Dennis? Who is it going to be? Uh, now, in the great words of Mr. Tony Patelis, DePaul stinks. <laughs> stinks. Okay? So, don't overreact too much to it, um, because I think Mississippi Valley State could give DePaul a run for their money. But mm. what I will say is if this team starts to get consistent production, especially from the perimeter to open up the, the paint a little bit more from Jace Carter, and he can start really knocking down some shots, get Tyrese Radford back, who right now is an undisclosed injury. We have not gotten any word, no word on it still. But when you have those three guys in, if Jace Carter can be that third option, man, this offense kind of changed a little bit. Kind of changes a little bit. I'm not going to overreact too much because it's DePaul, but just that's something to monitor here in the next few Texas A&M games. They play Memphis on Sunday. Big game for Texas A&M. Look for Jace Carter and his offensive volume. I'm going to be paying attention to it. Yep. No, I was, I was high on him. I said he felt like a Buzz Williams guy when they signed him. Like he, he just was like the guy that fits into to what they do. And so, yeah, big game against Memphis. And then we talked about it before, that huge game against Houston uh, the following Saturday. Oof. Uh, in that one. So two big opportunities here for Texas A&M, who, you know, already gotten a couple of nice wins over Ohio State, Iowa State. Um, but man, if they could get even one of these two, uh, that'd be still a, a pretty good step in the right direction. Like we said, if potentially even still without Radford. So if they can get those wins or one of them, uh, I think you'll be sitting in a really good spot heading into uh, SEC play, because I think their SEC schedule does not set up to be that bad, at least in the early going. If you look at their first five SEC games, they're at home against LSU, at Auburn, home against Kentucky, at Arkansas. So the two road games are tough. Um, at LSU, home against Missouri, home against Ole Miss, home against Florida. So like the first half of the SEC schedule actually, actually sets up pretty nicely for yeah. Texas A&M, I think, overall. So, um, yeah, so we'll see uh, how it unfolds. Actually, I'm looking at the rest of their schedule. Boy, they've got a – I like their SEC schedule. <laughs> like they – I'm not going to call it easy, but like I think there's a – a lot of potential wins in there, uh, depending on it how just falls thing. nicely with where they play at home yeah. and play away and stuff. Yeah, it's it's a nice setup, I think, at least uh, on paper. So there you go. Uh, a quick reaction video here because we only have three games to talk about. But we will tell you guys that we are going to be previewing, as we mentioned, uh, all these sort of big games on Saturday. Now, we will not do our usual kind of predictions for every single game, but we are going to highlight the big sort of uh, games on the schedule. And so if we leave your team out, like we said, we were joking about South Carolina, East Carolina, we'll have our reaction as usual to that game uh, probably on Sunday uh, as we usually do. And so, uh, but we were, we are going to talk about some of these huge games, Alabama, Purdue, Tennessee, Illinois, all these others uh, as well, Arkansas, Oklahoma. Uh, so a lot of games we're going to preview here. So be sure to hit that subscribe button, hit the like button as well. Check out all of our football stuff we've got here uh, entering bowl season transfers. Of course, everybody's transferring right now. But they was not transferring. Max Barr, uh, myself, uh, we're, we're all here on Southeastern 14. So we appreciate you guys watching as always. Again, hit that subscribe button, and uh, we will talk to you again here soon at Southeastern 14, presented by Bet Online.